All right, hey, good morning, church. Good to see you all this morning. Welcome to all you folks joining us online. In 2013, Tokyo, Japan won the bid, lucky them, for the 2020 Olympics. They had seven years to prepare and and plan, and they built huge uh, stadiums that could seat 80 to 100,000 people. They built uh, other multiple stadiums to take care of all the different Olympic events. They built uh, high-rise apartment buildings, 15, 20 stories high in their Olympic village. They put in um, workout facilities and restaurants and cafeterias. I mean, it was amazing, all the infrastructure to prepare for the games. As a matter of fact, um, the, the Tokyo Olympics cost $15.5 billion dollars. $15.5 billion to record the most expensive Olympic Games in history. So then 2020 came. Yeah, they, they couldn't have planned for COVID, right? They couldn't have prepared for that. And so in 2020, the Games got postponed a year. That one-year postponement cost them $5 billion to just postpone it a year. And then once they had the games, you couldn't have any fans in the stands. I mean, it was, it was kind of depressing watching it. I don't know if you watched much of the Olympics, but, you know, I was trying to root on the guys and just, man, because they said that having to compete, whether it was swimming or running or whatever it was, not having the fans in the crowd was really tough. Well, we know that, you know, stuff like that happens in life, right? Things aren't guaranteed. Uh, plans can get messed up. Things happen. Now, I understand that that can, uh, that can be challenging for those of you uh, that are really good planners, right? And you like to control things. Any control? No, you don't have to admit it. I know we have some control freaks out here, right? I mean, details, details, details. We create to-do lists for our to-do lists, all right? We are very organized because we're the people that think things through. We've got the plan Bs. We get things done. And all the control freaks said, amen. That's right. But I have a question for everybody. How much do we include God in our planning? Now, really, <laughs> tell you what, on your sermon note sheets there, I've got a little place for you. Why don't you circle one through ten? where you're at on including God in your plans. And this could be just the day-to-day -day plans. This could be the big plans, uh, the future. See, I, I bring this up because in our study through the book of James, there was a group of Jewish Christians who uh, weren't including God in their plans. They were being overconfident. They were being arrogant. And James addresses them and said, listen, this is not how followers of Jesus are to act. This is not how followers of Jesus are to conduct their business. And so he addresses this in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And that's our passage this morning. If you've got it on your phone or if you're going old school with the Bible, that's where we're going to be. It says this, starting in verse 13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. James says all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, well, for him or for her, that, that's sin. So James is addressing people who claim they're followers of Jesus, and yet they're going through life 
ignoring him. <laughs> ignoring God the Father in their day-to-day -day plans and in their future plans. I just got an idea that I bet that might be something relevant for you and me this morning. So before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Lord, we're busy people. Our schedules are full. And the question our passage poses this morning is, how much do we involve you in our plans, in the process? Father, you've led us to this passage in your word today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would challenge our minds, touch our hearts, and change us, God, that we would be the people you've called and created us to be. In your son Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, so how do we face the future with faith? What does that mean? Well, first, it means that we can't control the future. So last night, um, I did my routine. I got my clothes out for today. As you can see, I dressed up, and uh, I got all prepped, okay? And uh, thinking tomorrow, I'm just going to do my thing. I, I get up, I have a little bowl of cereal, have a cup of coffee, um, I pray a little bit, I, uh, I get ready, and then I get to the office early, I, I review my message again, and then we're, we're ready to go. You know, Sunday morning for me is go time, right? So I wake up, I'm usually pretty groggy, I look at the alarm, and I have to remember, go time, go time, go time, Sunday morning, go time, all right? So I get out to my truck to come. Wouldn't start. Dead in the water, okay? Wouldn't happen. Now, I didn't plan that. That wasn't in my plans. I could not control my truck. I couldn't urge my truck. I couldn't make my truck start this morning. So I had to go into the bedroom where my dear wife is still asleep. I said, honey, honey, she's waking up. What? What? I said, my truck won't start. I got to take your car. She's like, well, how am I going to get to church? I said, I don't know, hitchhike, man. I'll, I'll see you there. I'll see you there. So, you know, we can't control the future. We can't control tomorrow. Stuff's going to happen. Your car's not going to start, all right? Heaven forbid. So James is addressing this in his own day. So he says in James chapter 4, verse 13, Now come now, you who say today or tomorrow... We will go into such and such a town. We're going to spend a year there, and we're going to trade, and we're going to make a profit. Now, nothing wrong with that. That's what people, people did in that time. Um, that's what we do, right? Hey, we're going to go to school, and then we're going to uh, go into our career choice. We're going to get a job, or we're going to start a business, or we're going to do this or that. And, uh, man, we're, we're going to network. We're going to make our connections, and then hopefully we're going to experience some success. We're going to make a profit. Nothing wrong with that. But it is if you ignore God. It is if you ignore unforeseen circumstances. It is if you're prideful and arrogant, just thinking, you know what? I got tomorrow nailed. I got the future nailed, baby. And we leave God completely out of the picture. That's what James is addressing. And so he goes on in verse 14. He says, listen, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for just a little time and then vanishes. Isn't that something? The Bible tells us that we're dearly loved, but we're also just a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. And each and every day is a gift from God that we haven't earned, that we don't deserve, and really that we can't completely count on. When you think about it. Now, Jesus said the same thing. He uh, told a story in the Gospel of Luke. And, and Jesus put it this way as far as uh, our inability to control the future. He said in verse 16 of Luke 12, 
He told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus told this story. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. I think a lot of us probably secretly, that'd be a pretty good deal. Yeah, we worked hard in our business, in our career, or maybe you're a farmer <coughs> growing olive trees and making me cough, all right, something like that. And you get that bumper crop, and it's like, wow, this is great. And you're able to, to store it up, and, and you're able to, to tear down the old barns, build the new ones. You're setting up a future, and you, you look at yourself, you say to yourself, you know what? Pretty cool. I'm set for life, baby. It's time to eat, drink, and be merry, right? Wrong. Problem with this guy is he was not giving glory to God. This guy in Jesus' story was not trusting the Lord with his life with his finances, or with his future. And he was assuming that he owned tomorrow. That the future was his. Regardless of whether there was a God or not. And Jesus goes on in verse 20, and he says this, But God said to this man, fool, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared... Well, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, Jesus is making the point, listen, to face the future with faith means that we need to understand that we don't control the future, but there's a God who does. Um, I was called to minister to a church in central Washington, and uh, so we moved there not knowing anybody, um, and we weren't ready to buy a house, and there was a very generous man in the congregation who was also wealthy, and he had an apartment above his garage, and he allowed my family and I to come and live with, with his family until we found a place of our own. And... Uh, and, and this man was, was very wealthy. He made his fortune being um, an optometrist and a, and a medical eye doctor. And he was on kind of the, the early stages of LASIK surgery. And he made a, a huge fortune. And later in his career, the man was in his 80s when I met him. But uh, he bought um, orchards, apple orchards, and, and cherry trees. And he just didn't just have, you know, 10 or 12 acres. He had thousands of acres. And he, he diversified, as he told me. He said, son, I got orchards everywhere in the state of Washington. All right? And he was known like as the cherry king of uh, this town, where we were called in Yakima, Washington. And he was a great guy. He loved the Lord, very generous with the wealth that God had given him. And I remember on one... Uh, one afternoon in June, my family and I, we were out shopping, and all of a sudden, um, we got caught in a hailstorm. You ever been in a hailstorm? You know, rain is one thing, snow is another, but hail is just weird, you know? It's like it's raining ice cubes from heaven, you know? And just this hail's all over the place. You know, it's hitting your car, it's hitting you, it's, it's sitting there on the ground, and and it was kind of cool, actually. We're like, ah, it's hailing. This is crazy, you know. So we went back to the, to, to the house we were living, to the man, and we said, wow, did you, guys, did you guys see the hail? Did you guys go outside and check out the hail? Wasn't that great? And the old, the, the old man, he looked at me, the farmer, and, and he said, uh, well, it's not really great if you're a farmer. <laughs> and I'm from Southern California, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? He says, well, here's what happens when it hails. Those little, those little ice balls, 
that come down from the sky, they hit my apples, and they hit my cherries, and they make little dents. And when your apple has dents in them, or your cherries have dents in them, you can't sell them. People don't want those. When you go to the grocery store, you don't see dented apples and dented cherries. You see a perfect apple straight from the Garden of Eden, right? I mean, that's what we want. That's what we buy. And so uh, he had a totally different perspective on that hailstorm. But I remember he said this. He said, you know what, Jim? I've learned over the years, I can't control the weather. But I can trust in my God, who is in control of everything. That stuck with me. A man of humility and a man of faith. And so, you and I, we can make our plans. We can prepare wisely. We can get insurance. We can grow our businesses and our careers. We can take some risks and hopefully make a profit and do well. But you know what? We don't do it with arrogance as children of God. And we don't do it with presumption. We plan with humility. That's what James is saying. Trusting in God's provision for tomorrow. That's how we face the future with faith. Secondly, facing the future with faith means that we recognize God's will in our planning. So James goes on in verse 15, and he says, now here's what you should do, early church, uh, Jews that have trusted Jesus as their Messiah, here's how you should conduct your business, here's how you should conduct your plans, here's the viewpoint you should have according to your future, and he says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James is trying to get his people to have a godly perspective. You don't do life on your own, separated from the God you claim to worship. Amen, church? That's what James is saying here. Now, that phrase, if the Lord wills, you know, that, that's not like a, like a Harry Potter magic formula or anything, okay? It, it, but it does put us in the right frame of mind. It puts us in a frame of mind of faith, acknowledging that there is a God and I'm not him, and that he is involved in every aspect of my life. And I'm not going to live independently from him. Matter of fact, because I'm a child of God, I want his will to be done in my life, in every area of my life. So that means, God, I want your will to be done in my, uh, in my schooling, in my dating relationships, in, in my marriage, with my kids, in my friendships, in my job or career, in my ministry, in my finances, with my health, whatever it might be. I want your will to be done in my life. Uh, one pastor had a great kind of story here, illustration. He said this, think of your, your Christian life as a car. As a car, all right? So you're in the car. The question is, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus, right? Now, for some folks, <laughs> well, he's in the trunk. <laughs> trunk? What do you mean he's in the trunk? Well, on Sundays, you take him out. Come on, Jesus, let's go to church. And he's out with you for a couple hours, right? And then, hey, Jesus, back in the trunk, boom. And we go on and live our lives, right? And we don't think about it. We let him out of the trunk once in a while, and then we put him back in. Now, for some of us, we've got Jesus in the back seat. And we're driving. We're in control. He's kind of a passenger. Now, I know some of you might say, oh, no, that's not me. Heck, in my car, Jesus is riding shotgun. We're buddies. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question, church. Where should Jesus be in the car? In the driver's seat. Let me ask you a harder question. Are you a backseat driver? Right? So, so Jesus is driving you down the road, and he's, he gets to a stop sign. He makes a left-hand turn. And you're like, where are you going? 
He goes, oh, well, we're going down the road to generosity. Oh, I can't do that. I don't have enough money for that. And then Jesus keeps going down the road. He comes to a stop sign. He takes the right. He goes, well, where are we going, Jesus? He goes, we're going to go down, down the road to forgiveness. I don't want to forgive that person. He says, all right. Jesus keeps driving. He makes another turn. Where are we going now? We're going to go down the, the road to ministry. I don't have time for a ministry. See what I'm saying? We say, yeah, we want your will to be done. We want you to be in the driver's seat. But we want to still have control. We can be backseat drivers. And that's not the way God wants it to be in our lives. So I think we need to ask ourselves the question, are we making plans but leaving God out? Honestly, are we making plans, as small as they might be, as big as they might be, but are we leaving God out? We might need to ask ourselves, Man, am I being prideful? Am I, am I taking things for granted as I'm making these plans? Am I uh, being selfish? Do maybe I have the wrong motives in what I want to accomplish here? Is this what God wants? Listen, there's a better way. Facing the future with faith means that we recognize God's will in the process. We recognize God in our planning. Amen, church? And so, listen, that means that we commit whatever plans we have to prayer. That's a great place to start. We commit our plans to prayer. We seek wise counsel. What's the input of others that we trust regarding the things that we're planning, that we're thinking about? We consult scripture. And another thing that I think is really important is we take time to sit by ourselves and simply listen to God. Because we might have an idea to go this way, but we're so busy, we're just charging forward, we never hear the whispers of God saying, you know what, son, you know what, daughter, I'd rather you go this way. And if you'll trust me, I'll pave the way for you. That's the better way. I like the way Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 to 3 puts it in the New Living Translation. When it says, you know, we can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. That means, you know, we, we, can, we can charge forward with our own plans in our career, in our education, in our relationships, whatever it might be. But you know what? If we ignore God, we've got to remember he's got the right answer. That means there's someone who's wiser out there than we are who sees the bigger picture better than we can, and if we're wise, we're going to listen to him. But to be able to do that, we need to stop and intentionally take time to hear the voice of God. It goes on in verse 2. Now, people may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Come on, God, even my motives? Crying out loud. Yeah, that's God, right? That's our God. All-knowing, all-present, all-powerful. Good luck doing your own thing. I think sometimes man, God looks at us from heaven and we're, we're working hard. We're trying to make our plan succeed. We're putting everything into it. And, and, and we're going this way. He wants us to go this way. And he's just looking down like that. Like, seriously? What are you thinking about? What are you doing? Include me. In your planning. That's so important. And I was telling you about uh, when I got called to that church in Washington. Well, as we were praying about whether to go there or not, uh, one of the big questions was um, my wife's mother. My wife came to me and she said, you know, mom, mom's not doing too well. And my wife also is a, a registered nurse. And she said, you know, what do you think about taking mom with us so I can take care of her? Um, and uh, what you don't know is, you know, mom was having dementia and, and Alzheimer's, and physically she couldn't do much, and, and so we really had to, had to talk about that, and we really prayed about that. Lord, is this your will 
for, for mom's life? Is this your will for our family? Because i, I got to tell you, I was a little concerned about that because I knew I had to come into a new church and try to get things going, and a lot of my attention would be there. What about my mother-in-law? Is this, is this wise? But we spent time, and we dedicated ourselves, and, and we talked to other people. What is your will, Lord, in regards to not only this church, but bringing mom with us who won't understand it? And finally, we got to a point where we're saying, you know what? God wants mom in our future plans. And so uh, I remember we sat down, we told her, hey, mom, we're going to move to to a new church in Washington. And we'd always been in Southern California. And my mother-in-law had always been there. And she said, Washington? Why are you going to go where the president is? I said, no, not the president. She had this little, she's from Greece. She had this little Greek accent, really cute. No, mom, the other Washington. She goes, I didn't know there was another Washington. I'm like, yeah. She goes, where is this Washington? So we got out a map and we showed her. And I said, now, here's where you live in Pasadena. And here's Washington. She goes, oh, that's too far. I'm not going to go. Well, mom, you have to go. I don't want to go. Come on, Mom, just come with us. It'll be okay. So anyway, we forced her, and she came with us. We said, Mom, this is God's will. Well, I don't know about that. You know, so anyway, but she came with us, and uh, <laughs> it was so funny. It's, it snows in Washington, and uh, I remember our first winter. You know, it was snowing, and Mom really liked it. She didn't like going outside, but she loved seeing the snow. And, uh, and I remember just the sweet times that we got to spend with her. She loved coming to church every Sunday morning and, and hearing me preach her son-in-law. And that just really blessed her heart. And uh, she got to know uh, my, my daughter, who was younger than, you know, elementary school, junior high kid. And, and we just had two really great years with my, with my mother-in-law until we got to a point where mom in her Alzheimer's, we, uh, well, she just, she would escape. You know, I'd say, hey, have you seen mom? No. And she would, when no one was looking, she'd, she'd sneak out of the house. And she'd start just wandering around. And that worried us. I came up to her one time. She was, she was going up the street. And we didn't know. I said, mom, where are you going? She goes, I'm going home. I said, where, mom? Pasadena. I mean, <laughs> mom. Pasadena, come on, you know, mom loved the Lord, and, uh, and we lost her about a week and a half ago, she went to go home to Jesus, but let me tell you, she was ready to go home, she wanted to be with her Lord, and as we look back on it now, we had two wonderful years with my mother-in-law, where my wife got to care for her mom in love better than any, any home could care for her. I got to know her better, and my daughter got to know her yaya for those two years. But we included God in those plans, and I feel that God blessed those plans. I hope you do that too. Now, finally, facing the future with faith means that we repent of prideful planning. Prideful planning. James goes on now, and he says in verse 16, Now as it is, you boast in your arrogance about tomorrow, about we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to trade, we're going to make a profit. Listen, you should be saying, if the Lord wills, you're going to live and do this or that. But you're not. See, as it is, verse 16, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting, well, James calls that evil. Stop bragging about that. You don't control your own futures. You need to include the Lord in that. Listen, i got to be honest with you. Pastors can be some of the worst offenders. They really can. Of making plans and not having God involved. Now, you might think, what? Hey, I don't know if you've ever been to a pastor's conference, but I've been to a couple. So you're hanging around with all these pastors, right? And and you're getting to know these guys. Usually the first question they ask, so how big's your church? Oh, only (laughs) 2,000? Mine's five. You know, whatever. How big's your budget? 
And then these pastors will go on there with their big plan. Yeah, we're going to build this building, and we're going to create this campus. We're going to do this and that, and, and, and I'm trying to listen. Where's God in all this? As they're talking. I've been in ministry a long time. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that pastor. And if I ever was, Lord, forgive me. I think I've grown up. I want to minister out of the spirit, not the flesh. I don't want to be guilty of prideful planning. There's a guy who came up to me in this church, said, I'm leaving the church, pastor. Why? Because you don't have any vision. Really? Tell me about that. Yeah, we should be making plans right now for a 4,000-seat auditorium on that green grass. All righty then. I said, well, don't you think God would have really put that on my heart if it was the right time to do that? I'm not going to take our church into a place where we're not ready. Better yet, how about this? Not me, but us. How about us? How about we talk about those big plans that God might have for Calvary? We're going to do everything we can to reach this community for Jesus. Amen, church? And we're going to have plans. We'll do little things like trunk or treat or whatever, you know. And we're going, to, we're going to trust God with all those things. We're going to get input from the body. But I want you to know, as your pastor, I'm not going to lead us down a path based on my ego or my pride. I'm just not going to take you there. Because... I want to humbly serve the Lord and humbly serve you being led by God's Holy Spirit, not the flesh. That's my heart. And James goes on. He finishes this passage in verse 17 and he says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, well, to him or her, that's sin. <laughs> James finishes it off. All right, I've told you how you need to approach life. I've told you how you need to approach your plans. I've told you how you need to approach the future. You do it with an attitude and faith that says, if you will, Lord, I'll do this or I'll do that. Lord willing. That's what we do. James says, you've heard it, now do it. If you don't, you sin, period. Sometimes the Bible can be so darn black and white, you know? Bam. I'm giving it to you. Do it. End of discussion. That's the passage we have today. Now, some of us, as we're thinking about this, like, you know what? If I'm honest, I really haven't been including God that much in my day-to-day -day schedule, in my day-to-day -day plans, let alone the big stuff down the line. I get that. That's our human nature to want to do our own thing, right? We struggle with that spiritual nature and that sinful nature. Tell you what, here's where we start, repentance. We start with repentance. What's repentance? It's that change of mind that leads to a change in our behavior. So, we've heard God's word this morning. We understand that God's will is for us to include him to seek him in our plans that his will would be done not just ours that when we are planning we would say well if the lord wills i'll do this if the lord wills we can do that but we're gonna not going to move forward without god being involved in it that's a change of mind and then it changes how we act that's how it works. So what I want to say to you, church, is it's not too late. You can start relying on God today with your plans and your future. Uh, in my schooling? Yes. In my business, in my career? Yes. In my marriage? Yes. With my children, with my relatives, my grandkids? Yes. With my health? Yes. With my finances? Yes. And goes on and on and on. Yes, we start today. That's, that's the thing about God. I love it. Man, tomorrow's the past. Today, we move forward. Amen? Today, we move forward. So if you're not there, that's okay. 
If God's Spirit has challenged you this morning, praise the Lord, I didn't waste my week preparing this message for you. All right? And God's Spirit will change our minds, which will lead to a change in action. I love the way Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 puts it. It's one of my life verses. It might be yours too. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not just half your heart. Not just three quarters of your heart. All your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he will make straight your paths. Listen, when we, when we don't lean on our own understanding, that means we are not completely just trusting in our own brains, our own experience, our own abilities and talents. We're including God in the process as we trust in him with our plans. When it says acknowledge him in all our ways, that means when we're planning on that business venture, when we're planning on that education, when we're planning on those retirement plans, when we're planning for that relationship, whatever it is, we acknowledge that there is a God in heaven and it's not us. And that the creator of all might just have a word for us. But we can't live independently from him. We trust in him with all our heart. And when we do that, He'll make straight our paths. What does that mean? Well, a lot of paths in life are crooked, aren't they? A lot of paths we take sometimes are the wrong paths. But when we put our trust in him for our plans, he'll make straight our paths. That means he'll guide us. And he'll also remove the obstacles so that we might fulfill his will in our lives. And God wants the best for us. He's not a cosmic killjoy, all right? He wants us to have joy and, and, and freedom in our lives and hope. He wants our plans to succeed. But we honor him in the process. We give him glory and credit in the process. So my hope is that James's words make an impact in your life, in your relationships, in all the things that you're planning. And that we can all say together, let me put this on the screen, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And that's my Father in heaven and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, might we not approach our lives with arrogance, with overconfidence, with independence that ignores you. Lord, we thank you for the many talents that you've given us, the abilities, the resources. Thank you. Thank you. And the ability to plan. And to make a life for ourselves. But it's not for ourselves. It relies on you. Help us to include you. To seek your will. And your guidance. And your path. For our lives. For our plans. For our futures. In your son Jesus name we pray. Amen.